Aloha to the Innerverse tribe and welcome to the one within all. You have attuned thine self to the signal and I'm extremely glad to have you here. I've often said that we could solve most of the world's problems if the average person quit spending 40 plus hours of their best energy per week at a job and put at least half of that much time into growing food. Now, I may be a bit hypocritical because I'm definitely not pulling that off myself, but I am working on it, learning how to garden as I can, maybe not for making it the priority that I could though. Like all things in nature, healthy and lasting change is a gradual process, and so we're all at different stages of that development. Our guest today is someone who helps others find their way to the masterful green-thumbed permaculture lifestyle, and I believe he's even fresh from fulfilling some of his duties at the interwoven permaculture farm that he works at. I'm extra pleased to introduce Matthew Durney, also known as Soul Chi, a man with a multiplicity of skills all working to serve one larger passion to reintegrate humanity with our true heart, which is the earth itself. Earth and heart, they're anagrams for one another. Whether it's through his art, which is also found within earth and heart, or his permaculture skills, Soul Chi is an all-around awesome hyper-dimensional love ninja warrior who is sure to blow your mind and open up your rainbow colors within. He's also the leader of the Patchwork Hearts Collective, a shared space for artists to bring their positive creations to the world together. Make sure to look at the show notes for the episode links to Soul Chi and Patchwork Hearts Collective so you can stay informed of their offerings, including an upcoming artist appreciation and collaboration retreat in the Shawnee National Forest in Illinois at the Interwoven Permaculture Farm. Thanks for joining me on the show, my brother. It is odd that we're only just now finally recording a conversation because I've known you for so long, but as I'm going through this introduction, I'm having a massive, strong blast of deja vu, so that's bound to be a good sign, right? (laughs) Yeah, man, thank you for having me, uh, welcoming me into this space, and it is long due, but divinely timed. Yes, that's actually how it always works. That's I try to keep that Wu Wei mindset as much as possible. You know, the active non-action. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm finding it in myself too every day, man. Every day. <laughs> Cultivate it. Yeah, and I think maybe getting disconnected uh, from the hustle bustle city life for a while probably helps you see in even more direct nature providing for us. Mm, absolutely, yeah, and it's a, it's an interesting transition. I have not fully transitioned yet, you know, like yourself. I can be a hypocrite, I'm sure, in some of the things that I say and do, but we're here to ignite a fire within ourselves and others, and you know, finding that way in that transition and being humbled through those lessons and sharing those lessons with others, I believe, not only helps them find their way in whichever path they're seeking, you know, to return to the earth, but it also helps me better understand myself, you know? Absolutely. And I think part of what makes now different than any other time is that because we have so much knowledge and technology that maybe it's been many generations, many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years since humanity had this level of knowledge built up, we have mm-hmm. to realize that we're chasing a, our own tail in in some of what we're doing with society and culture and technology and there's always going to be a deeper mystery to investigate every question we answer gives us 20 more questions and i appreciate that the infinitude that life has for us but Mm. also once you hit that point you realize okay this is infinite stairs it's infinite wall And if we're sacrificing our very well-being and our planet for these resources that we need to keep answering certain questions or investigating things, it's starting to seem like a bit of a waste. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I hear that. And and so when you said that, you know, chasing our tail or swallowing our tail, it reminded me of the Ouroboros. And the Ouroboros is the snake that's eating its tail. And that's, that's full circle for everything you just said, I feel, you know, it's like everything we put out, we'll, we'll be taking back in one day. And everything we we receive or we take in, you know, vice versa, essentially. And so, yeah, what we put out there is what we end up receiving. And what we receive is what we put back out there. All these lessons, the physical, the mental, the spiritual, you know. It literally will come back to us. That's one of the problems with some of the religious paradigms is people have no awareness of the reincarnation cycle. And it's convenient to have this plastic wrapper on this thing now that you just throw away and pretend like it disappears. But 
whether it's two or three or even maybe just one lifetime away, that mountain of trash is going to have to get cleaned up and dealt with. You'll be there eventually. <laughs> yeah, the convenience doesn't serve you. It, it actually is an illusion. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we even see it in, in the single form of one lifetime, you know, and or just a few generations, what we're dealing with, with the things that have been put on us, you know, there's a, there's a quote that I like to share and it's from Wookiefoot and it, they probably received it from somewhere else, but it's, you know, we can't shed, we can't wipe the blood that we shed on our children's hands and the things that have happened in generations previous to, you know, us coming into this incarnation have really put a damper on our ability to just walk into this realm and be connected to the earth and be connected to each other. And so that's the work and per se the karma that we are, we're doing that dogma, you know, or we're doing our, that's our dharma, that's our work and breaking through the dogma rather. And, you know, if I may, this is really why I've been brought here. I feel spiritually to interwoven permaculture. And this was the first place that I really got hands on learning permaculture. Very amazing land that I feel very spiritually connected to. Eartha and Michael Longfield both are, you know, like family to me. And I felt so welcomed into this space to learn and, and to grow. And I come to find, you know, deeper in this soul search and, and these revelations of understanding myself through nature and, you know, my past, my ancestry, that I have deep roots here. And I actually believe that I am, my soul work is to stand here and to protect and guard this land and to welcome people in a good way to learn and to share the, that good way to live with the earth. And I'm actually a descendant of Daniel Boone. He is my sixth great grandfather and he, he walked through these lands and I'm coming to learn more about the things that he had done from both sides, the colonial mind and the indigenous you know, heart, let's say. And I've been blessed to be able to see those perspectives. My grandfather actually helped write a book about the Battle of Lawrence, which is, you know, a relative thing, a big part of Daniel Boone's experience. But later on in times, you know, he came through the Americas, you know, in those days, and he was just trying to take care of his family. And I'm grateful because here I am. But he did many things that destroyed, truly just destroyed, you know, or was a part of the destruction of the indigenous way and the connection to the earth. Though I believe, you know, from what I understand, he walked in a good way. There were still those parts in which he affected, you know, generations to come. That way he laid out the foundation for what was the colonial, you know, Babylon, the matrix. So I feel that I'm here to work that karma and to just simply stand here in this space with an open heart and to continue to expand it and understand how to live with this land. And uh, so, yeah, I think that comes full circle. You know, it's like <laughs> we, we have to think of the generations to come and the effects that everything that we do and say have on them. Yeah, there's an indigenous frame of mind that you should always plan with seven generations in mind, not just the present moment. And when we look at what's going on in the controllers, the colonial mind, that part of the collective unconscious that manifests in the form of slavery systems and debt systems and governments and wars and all of that, those leaders actually do plan hundreds of years to the future. So mm. we have to step up our game as people. If we want to get out from under the forms of slavery that we've decided on for ourselves and the forms of basically worshiping death instead of connecting to life, we have mm. to, we actually have to think about what our actions are going to bring about for generations to come. Every little action, ev everything does ripple out. The butterfly can flap its wings and influence a storm across the world. Well, what do you think happens to that man? And I'm saying this all like, what do you think happens to this can that you threw in the trash can, the aluminum can? It takes a long time to turn back. At the very least we could do is recycle it. And, you know, I just this very day, I threw away some stuff that I could have recycled. It's literally, I'm in a moment of kind of stupid weakness, I guess, or just laziness. I'm not to be too hard on myself, but it was to be real about it. It was just laziness. I went to go take my recycling out and I accidentally dumped the recycling into the trash bin. And then um, my colonial convenience mind was like, eh, that's just one time. You usually recycle it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All because right. I want to dig through the dirt and the nasty, filthy stuff. And that's pretty exemplary of what's going on is that we don't want to dig through the dirt and the filthy stuff of our unconscious to actually clean things up in there.
Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with all of our inner work. And that's what you, you and I are doing right here in this inner verse. We're doing that inner work to realize and recognize and connecting to what you'd said, you know, about it. You know, these folks who want to run a colonial world that want to destroy, it's like a thirst for destruction of the life itself that it gives to us. I thought immediately of a quote that I've carried for some time by MLK Jr. And it's, those who love peace must learn how to organize as effectively as those who love war. And, and that's the thing with our movement and the movement in, in its entirety, you know, since the 60s and 70s and to the present day, these distractions that are thrown at our movements to keep us docile in a sense or divided and separated and, you know, whatever these things may be. So it's seeing through those things. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful process that, you know, connections like this happen so divinely for us to reflect and to recognize these things. And, you know, as your brother, and I hope, you know, you as mine hold me accountable for these things that I say. That's what it comes down to is that's what community is to me. You know, we come together to reflect and decide who am I, who are we, and how do we hold that space and continue to strive and understand because there's always circumstances, you know? There's always going to be circumstances and that will make it hard or make you think that it's hard to do the right thing until you have a certain level of momentum. But that's the thing about momentum. It can go either way. Just because you have negative momentum or we all basically are working against negative momentum, getting into a rhythm of standing in the truth and making the right choice for yourself will ripple out to the way that you treat other people and ultimately the way that you influence the world. And I like what you said about, you know, we're going to say what we're saying here as a way to hold ourselves accountable to what we know. Actually, that's a huge part of doing a podcast for me as a person is that not wanting to be a hypocrite, <laughs> wanting to be honest, wanting to live in truth. It mm -hmm. does make it a little bit easier to walk the walk if you do say the right things. And I think that's part of the whole manifestation magic is it starts with speaking your intentions and then it, it flows into acting them out. So that goes for what you tune into and listen to as well, though, to anyone who's not, you know, physically part of this conversation, the voices in, that you hear in your head that you're literally hearing through your ears and then in your mind, it's all the same voice of our shared <laughs> self, you know, so you're, you're just changing the channel on the unconscious thoughts of, uh, you know, negative or worried things that can, drive and whenever you put on something like a podcast you're switching the channel to something that's got positive intention and maybe even a little bit of structure to the information that's useful right i like to say from what i've been taught words sound and power power of vibration somatics music how it shapes the waters within us that's what these words do we speak and we're literally speaking life it's incredible <laughs> Yeah, the water is not just within us either. It's all around us, even in mm -hmm. what we feel like we're on dry land, but we're actually underwater completely right now. It's just the less dense water than what you get <laughs> in, a, in, a, in the other form. Yeah, man. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and that's, that's a perfect realization of the whole Ouroboros story. You know, what goes around comes around, you know. I think it's a really clear point that, you know, many people in our time are not recognizing, you know, what they're putting within themselves. And that is not helping us create clear channels and it's mucking our waters within. And when we are not focusing on cleaning the waters within, you know, the water itself is the healing component, but if we dilute it, we are poisoning ourselves. And often whenever we poison ourselves, we are poisoning our environment or vice versa. And that really comes into, you know, where we're brought into this world and, and then what we're taught. I didn't always know these things. I didn't always have a level of reverence for water and, and all the elements. And these are things that I was, you know, truly humbled and taught through many indigenous teachings, mostly the Lakota during the Standing Rock movement uh, when we were standing against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I had a really, really wild experience making my way on that journey. I was in a relationship and I had just got in an apartment. So there I, you know, there I am. I was, I was living my Babylon lifestyle. I didn't want to get this apartment, but we needed a space. I was working. I'm doing landscaping at the time. I'm in this partnership and things were, things were, you know, just shifting for both of us. And, you know, we were 
we were moving around a lot, traveling and working with the Patchwork Arts Collective at its, you know, infancy when it first was birthed. And we were traveling from festivals to gatherings to, you know, powwows here and there and spreading the word about this movement. And the time came, actually, I'll step backwards. The reason we got involved with the Dakota Access Pipeline was because we were called into something called the Uptusk Caravan. And the Uptusk Caravan was something that Medicine Tribe and Rainbow Family put together. A lot of uh, leading musicians and artists put together this caravan that started one in uh, Oregon and one in L.A. And each day they would stop in a community or a big city and have a gathering, talk about the really great things going on, the solutions for the issues that are happening in that community. And so I was, you know, connected through that, through Medicine Tribe and some folks that I've been gathering with in person for the past few years. And that was all sparked online. Like how incredible, you know, the power of the internet. We really need to need to see it and, and use it for what it's worth while we have it. And so I was invited into this space and we, um, at the time I was living in St. Louis and they stopped in Ferguson. And this was shortly after a lot of the wild happenings there, you know, in the Black Lives Matter movement coming up and, you know, really finding that voice and, you know, the global movement that was created from that. And so the topic was police brutality and the Westlake landfill, which is a landfill um, owned by Republic Services in which they dump tons and tons of radioactive material from the Manhattan Project. So we were speaking of these things and how we're, we're we're working to be a part of the solution. And I, I wasn't intending on continuing on this caravan. I had brought some art out, you know, cause I was just gonna sell some art and offer that for those who are already going. And I'd recently started working with crystalline structures and wood and making pendants. And it was actually the first one I ever made and a, and a brother handed me a lot of cash for this pendant and was like, I want you to go. And I told him, I said, okay, we're going, we're gonna join the Uptest Caravan. We're gonna join our people you know, our tribe, tribe of tribes, and we're going to continue on. And the destination of this caravan was to the Democratic National Convention, where the whole Hillary Bernie thing was going down. And so we joined in Ferguson, St. Louis, and the next stop was in Ohio. And we gathered there. It was an incredible gathering. Once again, you know, talked about solutions for issues in that community, just inspiring people with words, sound, and power, and the power of song, you know. And... From there, we then went to um, Philadelphia, where the Democratic National Convention was happening. We took part in a wide variety of, you know, marches with different groups. But we were keeping the peace and we were bringing the people together. And it was a really incredible time, you know. And people may know this song and it goes, We are in this together. Yeah, yeah. One people, one nation, one tribe. One people, one nation, one family. One people, one nation, one tribe. And so that was a really influential time that brought me closer to a lot of people in my, what some may call neo-tribal culture, coming together and just learning how to counsel and come together and stand up and, and be warriors, we call ourselves peaceful warriors, peaceful warrior nation. So after that, the call to Standing Rock happened. And as we were on our way back to St. Louis, we stopped in Ohio again at uh, Sun Watch. It is like a indigenous, it wasn't a reservation, but it was more of a, um, a recognized space for ceremony and teaching and sharing, you know, the knowledge and the Lakota youth from the Standing Rock Reservation uh, were actually doing a rally or a relay on foot to deliver to DC the 140,000 or so signatures to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. So here's the youth again, you know, that's what we do this for. And they're not being heard. No one else is speaking for them. So they rose up and they spoke for themselves. And and we were truly honored and blessed to share this space with them. You know, we spent the night and hearing them and, and telling them, you know, that we are with you. And that is when the initial crew went out to Standing Rock and the people that I was with during up to us were the first people to get arrested at Standing Rock. So, you know, that led to, I had to go back, you know, I was still in Babylon. I was stuck with my apartment. So I had to go take care of that. And I'm in this relation and, I'm like, we're going, we're going to Standing Rock. We're staying all winter. That's, that's my decision. I'm, I'm going to quit my job. And as far as the apartment goes at the time, I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. Even if we lose our stuff, like I just felt so called. I quit my job. And the next day, <laughs> lover, but my partner was 
a little nervous about that. And she, she told me, she's like, no, 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 no. We, we can't do that. And me not being as strong in this intuitive heart path yet, I was like, all right. I went back to my job. And well, ironic enough, she ended up leaving and heading to Standing Rock. So I was at home alone with this apartment and I wasn't doing my work that I wanted to do. I ended up leaving, but instead of going to Standing Rock, I went to Mississippi Stand. And Mississippi Stand was another resistance camp, standing in solidarity with Standing Rock down the Mississippi River in Southern Illinois in Keokuk. And I was led there, ended up getting arrested with 44 other people. And that was one of the first direct actions that really brought a lot of energy to Mississippi Stan. Yeah, man. I mean, it's like, it's wild how, how we're guided. And I, it's the waters that guide us. It's the spirit. It's the fire within us. It's the earth. It's these, you know, the winds. It's all of these. If we listen to what we are, if we listen to ourselves, we listen to ourselves, we can intuitively find that path. And I had to go through a lot of harder lessons to just like listen to myself and love myself, you know? And so that led me to Mississippi Stand. A lot of incredible things happened. I was traveling a lot. I put 40,000 miles on a car in that year. And, no. and, I, and then I'm like, what a dipshit thing. Just look how much gas that was. <laughs> was well, gas and oil, you know? Yeah, I know. That's part of the, <laughs> that's part of the, waters of the earth in a way it's more like mm -hmm. even the blood of the earth you could say but yeah. think about you as a being would you give up a small fraction of your blood to one of your cells that was trying to use that little bit of blood to somehow bring healthiness and and wellness and ease to mm -hmm. the rest of the other cells <laughs> yeah and, man now that's not a justification it's just a hypothetical but you know as long yeah. as our our intent is to move away from that. I think we're going to, but we have to do it faster in a way without panicking. It's kind of a weird catch 22 because we do all have the ability to jump into the abundance of the heart path. And whether it's through native wisdom or something more Western like the tarot, for example, there is a path before each and every one of us to find and take into our understanding knowledge and wisdom about the waters and the earth and, and what fire means spiritually and what these aspects of self actually represent in the four corners of the physical world and in the four corners of our own consciousness and what who we are <laughs> and how those things reflect. And there's always a path to, to find more wisdom, to find more truth. And luckily, we're in a time actually where that path is almost so obvious, it's slapping you in the face in the form of, the internet and all the diverse <laughs> information that you have to answer any question that you might have about initiating any right action that you know. And that's the other beautiful thing about right action uh, is that we have infinity of actions we can take that are, are right. It's not harmful to another or to the planet. So it's right to do that. Therefore, it's our right. It's only a small number of actions that we're doing relatively that are the harmful wrong actions. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do need to bring attention to where those wrong actions are biggest and strongest, like what happened at Standing Rock and and what's happening in that that uh, landfill that you were describing in St. Louis is absolutely horrific. It's yeah. and this is all the military industrial complex, <laughs> and which know. which basically that's the biggest wrong thing that we're doing. I I would say is just engaging in this entire slavery system called government because there is no need for authority or hierarchy when everyone's living the heart path is zero is completely meaningless it's completely pointless other than as a control system so yeah, what does it mean governmental <laughs> mind control yeah literally means mind control yeah exactly precisely and that's the beautiful thing about getting into the heart is you start seeing the multiple meanings of words and how even the language that you and I are speaking in right now, if we weren't using it consciously, there would be, and there probably still is some anyway, but there's so much double meaning in what we're yeah. saying. We completely self negate our own intentions through our language and don't even realize it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm relearning a language. I'm rewilding. That's kind of like my, my biggest heart focus is like above all, like I, I'm rewilding. I'm getting back to my heart, back to my roots. 
Yeah, absolutely. The language. And one thing, you know, before we get any further, you know, speaking on, you know, it does take the oil, it does take the gasoline for us to recognize, you know, that we're taking too much to then share that information and bring awareness and then find a way to give back. We've been taking and taking and taking and taking. We rarely give back to this earth. You, you've even deepened my realization of this. And more recently, again, with crystals, with gems and, you know, minerals and rocks, we are mining this earth empty and it's going to collapse if it's not given back. And so I've been told by Pacha directly, the spirit of this earth, my mother, and also through the sisters in my movement and the sisters that I see as mothers, that we need to begin returning our crystals to this earth. And that, yes, they are meant to help us find our way. But as we continue to awaken to that, Ultimately, you know, the earth does share this with us and rises up to us. Well, many of these things were not given to us. We did not have consent to receive these things. And so that's, the earth is going to be good with, with or without us. For us to live in alignment, we have to understand that balance of give and take. How do we give what we can and receive that which only we need and not more? And so I think that's a lot of what I've been learning, you know, after Standing Rock and uh, and Mississippi Stand and traveling all over and just spreading the world word and was realizing, okay, I need to get back to my roots. I can I can protect all I want. Some say protest. I believe I was protecting, but that's just trying to fight a system that's already working exactly how it's supposed to work. This system, the government. The colonial movement, the whole system is working just fine according to what it was created for. And so the thing is, okay, well, I'm tired of thinking of the problem. I want a solution. And I saw it and I saw it and I finally came here. I came to Interwoven and I realized that this is the solution. We need arcs. We need places for safe zones. We need places to teach and to learn and to reconnect with the earth, to heal ourselves to purge those things that we had taken in unconsciously in our times in the matrix and to ultimately um, cultivate the future for generations to come. The big focus here at Interwoven Permaculture, Michael Longfield, great brother, doing incredible work here, is really focused on perennial agriculture and main staple crops here that are growing and being cultivated and being spread to this network of communities that we're also connected to uh, are chestnuts and hazelnuts. And so mass cultivation of these drought resistant, high nutrient dense foods that can actually replace both soy and corn, which are only annuals. And so we're creating a perennial that does not need, we're not creating, <laughs> we are only paying it forward and helping live with this system and live with these natural things and sharing this with this space to basically initially create something that doesn't need human input. We don't need the pesticides. We don't, and, and the, or the herbicides. And what are those made out of? Those are often made out of Petro. Absolutely. And, absolutely. It's all leftover byproducts. Same with everything people take that's pharmaceuticals, byproducts of the petroleum industry. People, we only want plants. Uh, that's all that we need to be working with. Sorry to cut in there. Yeah, no. It's inspiring me so much. I'm practically jumping out of my seat. <laughs> yeah, I'm fired up, man. I'm fired up. I was fired up before this conversation. I'm loving this. And, and so let me connect that to the whole Westlake landfill. Do you know who supported that whole thing of processing either uranium? It was Mollenkrop. Mallinckroft is the same folks who are making the pharmaceuticals. <laughs> what yeah. a story. What a story. You know what I mean? And so it's like, it's all connected and it's, it's, it just goes to show. I mean, it's, I think, you know, at one point the democracy, the Republic democracy, the Confederacy, and you know, all these things we're, we're working well for our forefathers. Maybe, maybe it wasn't always initially supposed to be this way. You know, sometimes I don't know, maybe it was, but these things turned around and corporations, now run the governments, which is something many know by now. So at the end of the day, dollar bill is your ballot, you vote with your wallet. And so the things we're investing in. And so that's again, why I came back. I wanna live a sustainable life. I wanted to live completely off the land, learning foraging and how to cultivate these gardens, how to cultivate you know gardens that will live long and that will be here for generations to come. I mean, these trees could be here, we don't know, seven generations from now. 
I like to think they'll be here for 700 generations, <laughs> you know, in the sense of if we can learn to live and reweave to that way. And that's what interwoven is about. It's really beautiful because I had um, created patchwork hearts before I met the interwoven folks and we're patchworking so that we can once again be interwoven. The thing that is already, I said the other day, I was like, it's a, it's a pleasantly painful experience to be reweaving something that was torn apart. There's actually, a, in Japanese culture, I think it's with pottery, there's a notion yeah. that the pottery, pottery that's been broken and mended back together is actually more beautiful than one that's never been broken. Yeah, they and, use gold. Yeah, and with plants, it's a little different. You know, if a plant doesn't get a good start, it gets broken when it's young. Yeah. Depending on the plant, it might not ever quite fulfill a high potential. But something that's different about us as human beings is we can transmute our own brokenness into higher levels of potential, not lower levels of potential. And mm -hmm. the patchwork thing, one of my favorite metaphors that I ever like to give about what's happening in our world and how humanity is transforming is how butterflies actually become butterflies. When they are in their, in their caterpillar phase and they are just eating and destroying leaves and having no consciousness of a balance, they're basically just consumers when they're caterpillars, these little worms. They're kind of cute, but relative to what they'll become, they're actually like ugly little guys, you know, <laughs> and they, they definitely are not balancing agents of nature in that phase, at least not on the immediate sense. But whenever they get into their cocoon or their chrysalis and begin to transform, it happens on a cellular level, one cell at a time. And these cells in the caterpillar become butterfly cells out of the body of this wasteful consum consumption machine. And in a wasteful consumption machine resists the cells that are becoming butterfly cells and tries to surround them and destroy them. Eventually, they start linking together. They're called imaginal cells or something. And as they link together, they overtake and restructure the caterpillar body into the butterfly using the seeming you know, wasteful and monstrous machinery that was there, turning it into something elegant and beautiful. But... I don't know about that metaphor because the butterfly doesn't last that long. So maybe we want to be something a little sturdier than that. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to ask you, how do you incur, what do you tell someone that wants to get started on the permaculture life? What, where do you point them to, to start resource wise? You said that you formed community early on through the internet. Are there any online communities besides patchwork hearts? that you would recommend or any resources on training yourself to be an agent of balance instead of an agent of consumption. I'm really trying to figure that out right now, man, you know, and, uh, medicine tribe, I'm still fully, you know, those are my, those are a big part of my roots, you know, and relating with people just like that, that are also just trying to find that way. And so as that's come, you know, I've come across, um, a space where we began, you know, holding these, these uh, gatherings in person. Oh, we, we're really all vibing online. I, I like your vibe. I like what y'all are trying to do and what you are doing. Let's get together. And so we began having some gatherings at a space in Worthington, Indiana, and that was known as the Medicine Tribe Gathering. The first one was actually in Freedom, and then we uh, relocated to this space, and we've now had, I believe, six gatherings, uh, maybe seven. Uh, I think that was our seventh one. About two weeks ago, we had the spring gathering. And um, so Sage Valley is the name of that place now. And they're now a nonprofit uh, creating a land trust so that we have an open space and we are holding down a space for travelers to come through, for woofers to come and learn on the farm, to come and learn how to build things. And so we're, we're weaving together with all these networks. That's what I see Patchworks um, in purpose is bringing together the collective of collectives just creating a network and a platform for others to speak on and through just as they're mutually doing for us and that's that interwoven um, way of life we actually created our second physical heart space at sage valley two weeks ago and this is a interactive community art installation to give you a visual, it's so much easier whenever I can show the photos and uh, the blueprints or rather green prints we've created for this process. It is 12 pillars in the shape of a heart in about a 30 foot diameter. And within this space is a, uh, a sacred heart fire. And this space and why we build these spaces is really dependent upon 
the functions that are called upon for the gathering, the event, or whatever we're called for. Our major focus as Patchwork Hearts Collective is rounding down and creating these spaces for eco communities that are wanting to welcome people in and do the hands-on work and do the mental and the soul work that it takes for us to come back together in community. I've created this space and what we do within this space is hold workshops, help others that are facilitating their own workshops. We have a, a art gallery surrounding it when we're there holding space. And we also have our vending tent where the artists or heartivists as we call ourselves and we believe everyone is a heartivist. You, my brother, are indeed a heartivist. I feel that heart. Thank you. We create the space for others to feel welcome to come in and, you know, understand and learn that heart path together. And so that was our second installation. Um, the first one was actually here at Interwoven. And it's been a learning process. So I, I believe this is how I'm doing my work the best that I can and to create this in-person network and to create this grid of communities, the Patchwork Hearts community web, so to speak. And um, so that we have connection between these communities, we have spaces where we're able to facilitate gatherings and welcome those who are interested in just hearing and sharing their heart or just receiving some heart, you know, diving deeper into, you know, their heart path and um, helping others do the same and walking together. And it's not easy to do it on the internet. You know, it's like, you can only get so far on the internet and then you're like, all right. So that's why the gatherings happened. And the first time that we built this was right before the eclipse gathering um, here at interwoven permaculture. So that was great. It was really amazing. It was a learning process. And then we went to Sage Valley and created that space. And so we'll be going back to Sage Valley to host events there in this space. And essentially, again, the point is to raise social and environmental awareness through our collective and create hands-on community actions of justice. And so we share our art, we have community collaborations, jam sessions, workshops, but we're also raising the funds through our vending so that we can support community actions, whether it's mass reforestation, food forests, natural building, we wanna build a schoolhouse. That's what's going to continue to grow from the heart space that is at Sage Valley is we're gonna add on to what we did and put a roof on and create potentially, you know, a education space. And, you know, so there's some really great things happening there. And it's just activating, getting people like to realize and recognize like the great untapped potential that you have as a heart of this and the generator that you have in your chest. It's a, it's a nuclear fission fusion love generator, you know, and you can create anything from love. It creates um, entire universes. Yeah, man. And it, and that's why we're weaving, we're reweaving our dreams. We're weaving these dreams and these heart dreams together. And it's not always easy work. So that's why we're creating this space around the fire so that we can have those conversations. We can have, you know, that dialogue and then initiate the actions that are also funded by our arts and the community gatherings and the things that are happening. So that happened two weeks ago at Sage Valley. And now three weeks from now, we'll be having the Patchwork Hearts Retreat here at Interwoven, where we'll be going back to the initial heart space. We'll be talking about it all like we are here and now. We'll be talking about how do we expand this and how can we as a collective grow stronger to support one another and understand this, this vision so that we can have this platform to stand strong. And I like to say, you know, hold your roots, spread your wings, and collectively carry the crown. Huh. If we, there's not too much weight on anyone. And we can find these ways to find our homes, to root down, to still be able to fly and connect with other communities and ultimately to feel and understand our collective spirituality. Yeah, yeah. so that's the, those are the networks. <laughs> I love what you said at the end there about spreading the roots and the wings because you can have your head up in the, in the stars as much as you want, but you need to be grounded. And what does that even mean? There's a lot of levels to what it means to be grounded. Besides just the electric grounding that you receive from having your feet on the ground or your skin touching the literal earth, which is hugely yeah. important, you also need to have your ground beneath you metaphysically, psychologically. What a lot of the unconscious aspects of ourself that walk around in the egos and bodies of Babylon... <laughs> They, what they're experiencing is complete groundlessness. And 
what I mean by that is whatever, the, like they don't even understand or have a decision in place about what the firmament is that everything in their universe comes out of. You know, what is the primary grounds? For some people, it would be God that is the bedrock of everything. But even that, whenever it's, you know, a completely external idea of this impersonal force, or even if it's a personal force to you, but it's still externalized, it's not actually grounding you because it's out there. So if, at the very least, if your grounds for, for everything in the universe is going to be God, it needs to be a recognition that the ultimate or the innermost, the absolute, the supreme being is actually within you and not out there and that's the only place it can be and that's what you mean by carry the crown we each carry the crown in that we each recognize our power as supreme beings and therefore the responsibility that we have to ourselves and to each other to well i guess we're not obligated to create a better world but we are responsible for what it is that we create. So we're going to get the rewards of not doing things in balance. So it basically does boil down to you are responsible for, for the whole mess, regardless of what part of it you made or didn't make. It just needs cleaned up. Damn it. And we're, it's all, right. all part. We're all, and we're all within the primary grounds of the earth. So if you don't want to call it like the Supreme being or, or God or whatever, there is a consciousness of this living planet that's beneath your feet that is extending itself into this micro platform that you call yourself. And your ego is actually just borrowing that consciousness so that it can operate on a level that's not purely animalistic. And, you know, right. not that animals are to be judged or, or destroyed or owned. Man, I had a so depressing. I had a relative literally tell me. That, of course, that the animals don't have souls and that they're just there for us to be eaten and used. And yeah. it was so shocking. I know that people think that way and that they think the earth is only like 5,000 years old and they believe that all that is in their scriptures, although it's really not, it's not even really in the scriptures that way. You know, it's depressing. And that's, that's where I think it helps to just, I guess, get away from it because I can stand there all I want in, in a room full of really sick people in the middle of any family and just project love and just feel, try really hard to be non-judgmental, but I still can't, we can't just completely turn off judgment because mm -hmm. part of that is discernment and yeah. it's enabling to a point to just be with people that are so exacerbatingly unhealthy and blocked from their actual true care. And their true heart. And I, I hate to say stuff like that. Like, I, I don't really know a better solution other than to just say, Sayonara, I love you, but I, I'm going to go do something productive over here. And if you want to suffer, that's your choice, I guess. You know, it's hard. Yeah, man. I, I've been learning that, that dance myself. That's the work of the warrior. You know, it's like, yo, you're kind of, you're kind of, I don't know if I can say this, you're kind of fucking up. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like, you can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of fucking up, you know, and it's like, you don't always like to hear that from your people. And, you know, you might catch some backlash for telling them that. And it's not necessarily even your place because you don't want to go around casting judgment. But if there's things right. that, yeah, like, there are, there are beings on this earth suffering that do not need to suffer. And I have family that feels the same way, you know, and they read the scriptures and they believe, you know, I'm like, yo, like it's nature versus nurture. A lot of them uh, that feel that way don't even actually read the scripture, though. They yeah, just know someone else told them it means, and that's why they think that animals don't have souls. Yeah, it's it's crazy. But yeah, that's the work of the warrior. And like, I've, I've really been learning that, like, I'm a very loving person. Like, people will see that in me and they feel that in me. And they express that to me, but they also say, damn, man, you know, Sochi, you're one of the most intense people that I know. Like, don't do, get too close to your, his fire, you know, unless you're, you're willing to feel that burn a little bit, you know, and I do it with so much love and I'm learning the tact and, you know, the, the delivery that I give, but I come from a different background, man. Like the reason I started this journey was because, you know, all my life growing up, uh, I, I grew up in a, a, a family of addiction um, on many levels like many of us. And as I got older and I graduated high school, I'm living with my, my old man and, and he had a broken back. He was taking Oxy. Oh, there's Mollencroft again. And then, you know, like many people, he, he things happen and he ended up switching to the needle. 
And from that, that's when my house that, you know, it was the first house I'd ever, we had ever bought and like had our own house. And, you know, I was living with my father and he was like, you know, I'm gonna help you so you can continue to chase your dreams and do what you do and find, you know, your way in life. And I really had like appreciated that, but then things turned around and man, I'm, I'm paying rent and I'm paying utilities and more people start showing up. My house turns into a low key trap house. But before I even realized my dad was on dope and then utilities are shutting off and I'm like, all right, man, I'm out. And that's what started on my journey, man. Like, and I still stayed in St. Louis, but I was like, okay, like something's got to change. You know, I see why my dad's in this situation. Yes, it was partially his choice, but he wouldn't have these choices of these things. If, if where's the poppy coming from? Because the poppy's coming from where our, basically our country is occupying and we're, we're just stealing resources. But that's a whole other topic, you know. Well, I guess I'd like to give you the floor to close us out and anything that you want to direct people towards or you want to talk about uh, for the end here that is just coming into your heart. Thank you, brother, for having me and uh, welcome me into space once again. I'm, uh, I'm looking here at Inwoven and I'm seeing the gardens and I'm seeing the trees and I'm hearing the birds. They're just, they're just saying, welcome, welcome home. Come back home, come back to the garden. And uh, the medicine that you're seeking will find you. And, you know, we are here, we are here to share our love, to share our medicine. And, you know, the closer that we get to earth, the easier it is for us to find our heart and to find our medicine and to connect with other people. And with that being said, you know, I'd like to welcome you, my brother, and anyone who may be listening to come into this heart space and feel free to connect, come and share your heart and unite for a cause with us. We're figuring it out as we go and more hearts and minds, more power, you know, that we collectively come together to share the more of a difference we can make. And I see, you know, as we're creating this green print of a space to share art, share music, share healing, share, you know, share the earth with one another to sit around the fire to share the sacred waters and to feel and listen to the wind we're going to be able to make change happen far more quickly and far more sustainably as long as we continue to ask permission of the earth than we could have ever imagined and it's going to be a patient process the next few years but within the next five to seven years there's going to be spaces if we come together and do that work for all of us to return to a good way and i also want to say you no know, i don't believe that the urban lifestyle or you know the cities are something that i ever intend to leave behind i just feel that it's very important for us to return back to the forest return to the prairies return to the rivers and to the elements in which we are um, and take that back and share that with the cities because of the urban areas. Because ultimately, man, I'm, I was born and raised in St. Louis. And I love all of my people in every place of this earth. And I believe if we come to understand and reconnect with the forest and the natural, the mystic, then we can bring that and we can create cities of light. It's a journey. It's, I, have, I have one thing I'd like to close this out. The end of one of my spoken words, I've been working on a lot of music myself as well. And it's... Peace to all my water protectors. We will be victorious. There may be hard times ahead, but we are rainbow warriors. Rainbow warriors. And so it's just about standing up for what's right, and you'll find your way. And I'm here to walk in peace with each of you. So I welcome you to come and uh, co-create this heart space. Yeah, this thank my you family. very much. The tribe, all of you, you can do it anywhere you're at. Good. Creating the heart space has nothing to do with coming to Illinois and or, mm -hmm. or anywhere. It's it's an, an inner space that you cultivate every time that you are making the conscious choice and the conscious intention and effort for love and remembering that not just that you are a supreme being, but that all being is the supreme being <laughs> all being is there for you to respect and find the most res the most harmonious reciprocity between you and the other aspect of being that you ever encounter and so mm. just uh, i guess you know where do you put that into practice 
look someone in the eye and listen to them a little bit longer before you say, I've got to go or find out what it is that they're seeking from you. You don't realize how much you have to give to others unless you actually sit there and put them first, even in a small way. And it's the small ways that actually are the big, where the big things come through. So if it, if Mm -hmm. the small thing that you can do is have a small garden, the small thing that you can do is listen a little more and try to care a little more. It's just all about, that's what it's all about. That's the heart space. And don't get down on Mm -hmm. ourselves for not being perfect, but also be realistic about how urgent it is to begin the process of changing. And as long as you're taking steps on your path every day, I think that you're, we're all safe and protected in, in that walk together because we're carrying the crown together, but that the crown is also lifting us up together the, the shared Supreme self that we're all, you know, expressing. So it's awesome to have conversations with guys like you, man. I, it's too bad we couldn't go a little longer, but I think that for our, I think that for this particular link up, we're at a good point because we're having a few call problems and I was only going to keep you till a little longer than now anyway, but let's definitely do it again, brother. Maybe we can even structure something out and have a, a more, more structured information in a, a future conversation. Cause you know, I love where we go as we just harmonize our, our hearts and minds together and see what comes out. There's clearly some very interesting chemical reactions between our energy that, <laughs> that I like to see. Uh, I love the reflection that you're holding up to, to everybody and to <laughs> the, the higher self. So thank you for that. And let's do it again. And thanks so much, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. I'm honored and well said with the heart space. It is everywhere and anywhere. The all is the one and the one is the all. <laughs> Ah, yes. Cool. Thank you, brother. Hey guys, we did it again. We have completed another episode. And I know it was a little short, but Solchi and I were having connection problems because he's out in the boonies somewhere. And I don't fault him for that. (laughs) And also, we didn't have time to go longer than that because it was a very improvised meeting. Because I hadn't had an episode recorded and I didn't have one out last week. I'm a little behind on my production schedule, but I'm trying not to give myself too much pressure over that. You guys have been nice about it. But in general... I do want to get the let out and figure out a way to get my life into a rhythm and a balance where I can easily put out episodes once a week. So I'm working on that. So thanks for bearing with me. And even some things have happened this week in my personal life and last week that made it quite hard to work on anything. So, you know, these are the rhythms and flows that we have to deal with. It's the shadow work that we're all being called to deal with. It's we can't just up and enter into a complete paradise where everybody's on the same page, right? There is a transitionary phase and what we can do to work on this shadow for ourselves consciously, both in the inner and outer world, it's going to help the generations to come because as we've been talking about, your water is constantly flowing in and out of you. Water is our connection between the outside world and the inner world. It's a free flowing interchange and it's all one big connected ocean. The biggest secret of all occult sciences and studies and secret societies and is that morality equals freedom. And that's because what you're doing to others and how you're treating yourself mentally and physically literally echoes out and flows out of you into the waters of the world and will either enslave you or give you a boost depending on what type of intention and energy you're doing. And unintention or lack of intention, that's a form of intention too. And that definitely comes back. That's why people that don't live a very intentional life wind up feeling like life is happening to them. 
and that things just keep happening that are outside of their control or that they don't want. Now, of course, someone living an intentional life still deals with those things, but they look for ways to actually transform and rise above these challenges as they come and see them as the stepping stones into their higher ideal existence. And one thing that we touched on, but we didn't really talk about as much as I would have liked to because I'm pretty fired up about it lately, is just the notion of the controllers in our reality right now and what government really is. And it's slavery. <laughs> Actually, Mark Passio, one of my favorite podcasters, just showed up on one of my other favorite podcasts, The Higher Side Chats, and I highly recommend you check out the episode. And he started out the interview with, thanks for having me on, Greg. Government is slavery. And I know I've talked about that in the past, but and I don't want to be focused on just one thing, but we do need to figure out ways to disconnect from these systems. That's what she was talking about. A return to tribalism and nature is required, but I will push back on anyone that wants to think that we need to go fully no technology, fully tribal. I'm not sure I'm buying that because the evolutionary phase that we're involved in and technology they seem obviously connected and maybe in a good way, maybe not. I definitely don't want to see the full other end of the spectrum where we have everyone becoming cyborgs and, and AI rules over some dystopia where there, no, there's no more animals or plants and everything's metal and gray. So I do want to advocate the middle ground because you know I don't, I, I don't accuse Solchi of being off the middle either. He called in on a cell phone. But just in general, I don't want to sound too preachy or prescriptive. And if I do, it's because I am trying to honor certain ideals and implement them into my life. And we did touch on how talking about things does tend to make you feel more accountable to yourself. So I do hope all you guys hold me accountable for things that I say, at least in your mind. And together, let's all have a higher ideal of one another. Not that we are all perfect or we can't have fun, but that in the end, as Solchi said, the all is the one and the one is the all. So by lifting yourself up, you're lifting me up and vice versa. So <laughs> you could lift me up a little bit physically and maybe thereby lift yourself up by subscribing to Interverse on Patreon. <laughs> yeah, I know that was, that was a pretty rough uh, transition into a promotion, but I do have to ask that you guys consider it. Like any creator, I need reciprocity for what I'm putting out there if other people are tapping into it. And I do happily give away the free show, an hour every episode, but there's a lot of cool stuff in the extended episodes that you can look at it like by subscribing to Plus, you're doing the same thing you do as buying an album from a musician or buying a painting or a print, and it's not that expensive either. It's $5 a month. I'm thinking about how I can restructure the reward system there to make it more reasonable and realistic because right now I'm not actually fulfilling all the things that I promise on there, and I apologize for that. And that's going to get worked on. But I do promise that there's going to be extended episodes every time there's an episode. And this one's a shorter extension, but it was still interesting. And we talked about all kinds of cool stuff like beta testing, Skillshare, community networks, sorting out your heart's desires from your ego's ambitions. That's one that comes up a lot and it's very worth contemplating. Not that you shouldn't be in balance with your ego as well, but you know you have to be able to tell the difference and we're constantly learning what the difference is in a way they free flow between each other. So maybe there isn't so much a difference, but that being said, your heart is the thing that's going to give you a harmonious desire that's with everything else. Whereas your ego might want to put yourself above and yeah, there's nothing wrong with pride, but there is something wrong with thinking that you are innately inherently better than other beings, of course, because all being is transcendent of physical forms or possessions or any form of energy whatsoever being is singular and that is our unity in the fact that we are beings but we also talked about coming out of the separation mindset and realizing we're all one being because the separation mi mindset is really accelerated by commerce and we talked about that and how to re-inhabit our world village as family instead of as competitors we talked about how the energy of large crowds and gatherings is possibly being spiritually siphoned when it's not being intentionally directed talked about practicing discernment to clear what's unhealthy without judging other people's hearts. We talked about seeing the correlation between the plants in our garden and our human family. And a lot more, but I don't want to give it all away in the outro. It was short, like I said, because of the connection problems, but 
hey, you do have the opportunity to get more Solchi. You could go check out the Patchwork Hearts retreats if you're local to Illinois or nearby or in the St. Louis area. And speaking of the St. Louis area, anyone in the near tri-state area should be getting concerned about the Westlake landfill that Solchi brought up. I actually need to get off the trash service I'm using. And this whole thing has made me realize really what would be smarter to do was just cancel all trash services and not have anyone pick up my trash for me and quit outsourcing that. And I could do like my buddy David of Wisdom Traders, whose music is in this episode. What he showed me today is just filling up plastic bottles that he gets from other people with his disposable trash, and it makes them a little sturdier. And people use that to build earth ships. And then also I could just recycle everything I possibly can and maybe burn stuff that I couldn't recycle. That way I'd have an annoying ritual that I had to do of burning the trash and feeling like I'm wasting and maybe it would encourage me to do less trash. But the Westlake landfill, that's way worse than just trash. That's straight radiation and that's crazy and that should be stopped. <laughs> so anyway, I guess uh, I just want to remind you as we're wrapping up here, not only are you the one, but you're only the one if you know that you are. Just like the Oracle taught to Neo in the Matrix. Not that I'm nearly as smart or sassy as the Oracle, but the allegory in that movie applies to all of us. If you want to have a connection with your intuition and your heart, you got to start feeling for it, asking the question, and watching for the reply. So cultivate things that bring up your mindfulness level, your attention level. Attention and awareness, that, is, that equals consciousness. That's your spiritual currency. So <laughs> I wish you guys all really well with that journey of, of learning that we're all on together and I'm struggling between the idea right now of pick one thing and do it really well versus my Aries tendency to start new things all the time. So thanks for bearing with me while I'm going through sort of some turbulence and keeping this podcast rolling the way that it could be. We're getting better here though. I do feel it and I know I'm getting better at sustaining these ventures that I'm on, uh, but there's not more time being added to the day. So my time's getting crunched. You guys can help me out by subscribing to the podcast on Patreon. And uh, maybe if you do that, I'll feel like doing some more charitable or activist work. <laughs> Just kidding. I think that's what needs to change in my life, actually, though. I need to spend a little more time that's directly involved in helping other people in a charitable way. But anyway, I'll ask for a charity from you before I sign off. Get on iTunes and leave the show a five-star review by looking it up through the iTunes podcast app. And that will help direct other people to our platform here called Interverse. And I'll love you a long time. If you leave a written review, I'll totally read it on the air. And thank you. And I do thank you just for listening. And I extra thank everybody who is a Patreon subscriber, especially the Plus members. And I'm looking forward to some things to come. I got some great guests lined up. I'm getting back on this horse. I've had some trouble. Like I said, Grandma's been sick. And, you know, these things just come out of nowhere. But... We're doing it. We're turning the six to the seven. Um, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> All right. I love you guys and I will catch you on the flip side.